Welcome back, everyone. Now we will move on to the next portion of our agenda, which provides an exciting opportunity for our four finalists to present to the judges and our audience. I was lucky enough to mentor each of these finalists prior to today's pitches, and I very much look forward to seeing a well-deserved spotlight on each of these companies. Leading the session will be our moderator, Nitya Sharma, Manager of Strategy at Women's World Banking. Let's begin. Thank you, Martin. I am thrilled to kick off the third annual FinTech Innovation Challenge. When we launched the inaugural FinTech Innovation Challenge in 2019, our aim was to identify FinTechs with a deliberate focus on helping women build their security and prosperity. This year, as the world continues to grapple with the health and economic impact of COVID-19, we focus on building back stronger and better than ever. And women are a key to that recovery and resilience against future shocks. We're proud to have received over 80 applications from 34 different countries this year. I'd like to thank our advisory committee, my colleagues, Karen Miller, CJ Yuhas, Ajay Ashe, and Sriram Jagannathan for their invaluable engagement to review, debate, and select the four top finalists. It was no easy task. And thank you again to our challenge sponsors and supporters, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Ernst & Young, and Novi, along with this year's Making Finance Work for Women sponsors, as well as our core funders, Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, and the Visa Foundation. In addition, I'd like to give a special shout out to our Challenge Grand Prize contributing partners, New York University, NYU School of Professional Studies, and Visa Inc. Our two lucky grand prize winners will receive a FinTech Fueler package to support them in their journey for growth and impact, including a customized UX design guidance session furnished by Visa Inc., up to $4,000 to be applied towards the cost of any NYU School of Professional Studies non-credit course or certificate, an exclusive pitch meeting and feedback session with Women's World Banking's asset management team, four one-on-one -on -one leadership coaching and feedback sessions with one of Women's World Banking's executive coaches, and a guaranteed spot as a featured speaker at a Making Finance Work for Women event in 2022. We're also thrilled to share that 75% of the applicants this year were female founders. Elevating women leaders has always been a critical part of Women's World Banking, and I would like to thank Anthemis for providing the inaugural prize for the Female Founder Award, launched this year as part of the challenge to recognize female leaders in the fast-growing financial technology sector. After a rigorous evaluation process over the last several weeks, we're thrilled that you'll be hearing from our four finalists today, Mosabi, Hive Online, Boost Capital, and People's Pension Trust. These four institutions have demonstrated the potential to reach unbanked and underserved women with financial solutions to help them build their economic security to protect against shocks and prosperity to build their business and household income. These four solutions offer a glimpse into the future of financial innovation for women. In preparation for today's pitch session, each finalist also received mentoring to refine their pitch. I'd like to thank Credit Suisse, BCG, and EIB for their support in mentoring our finalists and Martin Eerig, today's wonderful MC and Women's World Banking board member, who supported our finalists in further refining their presentations. So let's get down to business. Each finalist will have five minutes to pitch to all of you and our judging panel, who I will introduce in a moment. The judges will then put each of our finalists in the hot seat for 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. The judges will then deliberate to decide the two grand prize winners and we hope you stick around until the end of the day to see who wins. Let me introduce our distinguished judges panel. Mary Ellen Iskandarian, President and CEO of Women's World Banking. Sarah Ellenson, Principal America's Strategy and Transaction FinTech Leader of Ernst & Young. Dave Kim, Program Officer, Financial Services for the Poor, Bill & Melinda Gates Foundation. Pat Patel, Principal Executive Officer, the Monetary Authority of Singapore and Otto Williams, Senior Vice President, Head of Partnerships, Innovation and Digital Solutions of Visa Simia. Now let's get started. Our first finalist is Musabi, represented by Kai Ao, co-founder and Chief Creative Officer, 
and Chris Zerwanka, co-founder and CEO. Hi everyone, I'm Kay, introducing Mosavi, a hybrid of fintech and edtech. So 80% of all work in Africa and even more among youth and women is informal. But these informal workers are twice as likely as formal workers to live in poverty. And also they are underserved and untapped segments for financial providers. But because of skill and knowledge gaps, adoption and usage is often a struggle. This context is really personal for my teams. My co-founders Chris and also Francis are also here, by the way. And each of us has spent at least a decade immersed in boosting livelihoods for the continent's rising class. But across all of our efforts, we saw that these approaches weren't digital, they weren't data-driven or sustainable, and this really limits their scaling potential. So we came together to form Osabi for this mission, unlocking financial opportunities through innovative learning. In a sentence, Mosavi is a personalized learning platform for financial and business education, and most importantly, for better engagement with financial products. Our patented matching engine and marketplace links to resources that can help complete this cycle. These three use case examples show how we're making impact. One, a small informal business owner qualifies for her first business microloan by learning through Mosavi. Two, Women in our partners' village savings groups use our apps on affordable Kai OS phones to build soft and hard skills, from mindset and motivation to budgeting and bookkeeping. And three, with the World Food Program, refugees learn with our Mama Mosavi chatbot for business and financial coaching. Our learners see modules on entrepreneurship, financial literacy, demystifying digital platforms, interest in borrowing, data privacy, client rights and responsibilities, as well as soft and hard skills. Our Mosavi journeys align with specific themes and evolve with our users along the way as their needs change. And our gamified edutainment uses quizzes and pop-up nudges in local context, in local languages, and also has audio and visual cues that address limited literacy and numeracy. And using storytelling, we use relatable female characters to experience business and financial challenges and successes that can resonate with our users. Our learning is done on smartphone and data and basic phones with or without data and also in real time with the wise Mama Mosabi chatbot that you see here. Our users can onboard through sponsored campaigns with our partners, through modules embedded in product screening or organically to be matched with providers. So you just heard about the learning experience, the edtech part of our solution, and now let's go back to cycle to that zero, to cycle to that, <laughs> zero in on that fintech part of Mosabi. For a B2B business model, providers subscribe to license our platform and data insights and pay for lead generation. For those partners, learning progress and achievement feeds our dashboards and reporting, and they deploy Mosabi's e-learning, gamified assessments, and regular financial health checks all through our central learning management system. Our open API library allows any of our bank customers to log into their dashboard and connect their banking systems to our APIs for listing the products in our marketplace, for onboarding in KYC, and for our algorithms for matching and alter alternative credit scoring. These customers range from customer banks, mobile network operators, innovative fintechs, and microfinance, as well as the global development sector. We're also really excited to soon provide Mosabi's financial learning as a service to other finalists of Women's World Banking from this year, and also the past years. Mosabi's North Star is matching users with products that fit their needs and arming them with the knowledge to make the best choices from among these providers for holistic financial health. We've had thousands of users across seven countries in West and East Africa. And by sharing the missions of our partners, the majority of our users have been youth, women and youth. So the big question, does it work? Well, yes. Controlled studies show that Mosabi expands and empowers client bases, reducing borrowing defaults, increasing transaction frequency and volumes, and boosting earnings, all moving the needle so these grassroots workers are financially included and provide higher value to financial institutions. As we close, I'd like to add a note about the origins of our name. Sabi is a common word in some African pidgin languages, meaning knowledge, wisdom, and street savvy. So you can see how we think this really nicely reflects our mission. We invite everyone to join us in boosting the skills and financial health for the businesses of Africa and beyond. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. We will now open it up for, for Q&A from our distinguished judging panel. I, I was just going to ask um, sort of a basic question, but the what is the role that Mosabi plays? Is it creating the content, orchestrating the partnerships, providing the tech, all of the above? What What's the specific role of Mosabi? Yeah, it's really all of the above. So we, we're a B2B company, so we work with different partners, so mostly telcos, financial institutions, banks, etc., to really tap into their user base or also help them generate more users organically. We create all of our content in-house, so all of the artwork that you saw in this deck and also on this slide, and also the artwork that you see in our app, our chatbot, etc., that's all created in in-house with our production team that's you know locally based on the continent as well and we also create the tech from the android application to the whatsapp chatbots um to the dashboard that you see as well pat i think you had a question sure um yeah thanks for the presentation and um just a little bit more about your team if you could just share a little bit more sure um i can start with myself so i'm Kay, a co-founder and also a chief creative officer my background was originally in animation and digital arts. I graduated from the University of Southern California and then ended up working in financial inclusion with animated work um, in Tanzania, then moving eventually to Kenya, and now I'm based in South Africa. Um, Chris has also worked with Deloitte, and he has over 20 years of experience on the continent working in financial inclusion. Um, and then Francis is also a member of the Mai Institute, coming from Nigeria. And he's also an Acumen Fellow as well. Um, our CTO, Patrick, is also here, or he's on the slide, but he wasn't able to join us today. And Jessica is also our Chief Learning Officer, um, who lives in Rwanda and is also part of the Fundacion Capital. Yeah, if I could, uh, this is Chris, if I could just add a follow-up there as well. Kay explained, uh, yeah, really well. I think we've put together a diverse team for a really sort of unique mission that we have, right? Um, we're combining, I mean, this background that Kay has coming from Hollywood, producing feature films and doing animation, really injecting creative spirit into building this edutainment uh, experience. We want our learning to be entertaining and compelling uh, as well as driving learning outcomes for financial inclusion and financial health. Uh, and those learning outcomes, Jessica has been working on the continent for 20 years, is really a thought leader in financial capacity for the micro to small enterprise segments uh, on the continent. Um, I come fin from financial sector expertise um, and financial inclusion. And uh, I think the rest of our team really uses all of that, wraps it together to both build tech, but also build this, this compelling um, long-term lifelong learning experience uh, that can be in every African's pocket. Um, I wonder if you could take us through the some of the financials. I'm not really understanding the sustainability model here, and if you could sort of take us through how you make your money, and then and then where you actually are financially in terms of break even and um, and and profitability and all of those those important metrics financially. Um, yeah, so those are good questions. Uh, and um, Kay talked through our core business model, right? Which is this pillar that you see on the screen here of providing uh, upskilling and uh, financial uh, platform uh, services to, to financial provider institutions, helping them upskill their client base and match and engage new customers using uh, Mosabi's learning. Um, so they subscribe to this platform, software as a service, uh, paying either monthly or annually. And that subscription uh, unlocks all of the, the power and tools of our, our, of our platform. And that's the, um, the ability to, to see learning progress, engagement with channels, um, automate a lot of that to occur alongside financial events um, in their uh, clients' lives. So to making those financial events teachable moments, right? Uh, that, that automate the, the nudges and pushing of uh, Mosabi content to various channels. Um, along with that, of course, we're also a content delivery library, right? Um, so our provider institutions, once they subscribe, they get access to all of our core library that we have, as well as a, additional courses and lessons that we add over the years. It's like having a subscription to Netflix where you keep getting titles that come in 
uh, as they're added. Um, so that, that is our core financial model. Um, pricing for that is based on uh, the size of user base that we're used to reach. Um, and that's sort of stratified in tiers. Um, and like most uh, B2B contracts, those are sort of bespoke contracts that we, well, we have pretty straightforward pricing along those tiers. Um, and our other um, revenue stream is uh, conversion fees for when we do onboard new customers to a financial product. And that's sort of calculated as a percentage value of the financial product. Um, that core model is how we make money. Um, it's from both the financial providers, but also global development sector actors like NGOs, uh, aid agencies, other uh, capacity building initiatives that also subscribe to our platform to bring our learning to their beneficiaries and to make matches with our financial providers as well. Um, we're currently, we have positive unit economics currently uh, and our financial model projects us to be uh, profitable at the end of next year. Great. Dave, I think you wanted to jump in with a question. Sure, thanks. Uh, hey everybody, uh, wonderful presentation, thank you. Uh, just a few questions. I probably have too many questions, so I'll try to edit really quickly. Um, so, but maybe two different lines of inquiry. The first one is, can you tell me a bit more about the mix between your B2B model as, we, as well as your B2C model? I think I heard something about you also bring your, uh, your own customer base, but I may have I misheard that. So I'd love to understand the mix between B2B and B2C here. The second one is, I would love to learn a bit more about uh, just your B2B process, right? Uh, what types of partners have really showed up here? And how many of them decide to uh, stick around for another round of subscription? Uh, I would love to understand that churn uh, right there a little bit more. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Okay, I can take that one again. Um, and uh, yes, you're, you're, the building a B2B business model um, is sort of where where the where the sustainability of the comp company will will lie, right? If we're able to do that successfully, and, and it's not easy for an early stage startup. Uh, in our first couple of years, it definitely took some building some momentum and traction, as well as refining our platform. And we keep working on that every day. We keep working towards being this real turnkey B two B platform that that our partner institutions uh, like the categories you see on the screen. Um, can quickly activate and onboard too. Um, we do not currently have a B2C model. So uh, while these partner institutions are deploying us to their user base and we're having more broad-based um, deployment to uh, the non-financial partners that are on sort of the, the left side and the right side of the screen, both for research and content digitization, as well as distribution, um, those are still the, the facilitating institutions, NGOs, um, civil society organizations, uh, aid sector that are subscribing to our platform to bring it to their users. The, our users don't pay anything to use Mosabi. That may change in the future as we evolve and serve different segments. We think like a, a premium level of Mosabi learning could be interesting for users that, that are taking a graduated approach and building their businesses and have more advanced needs eventually. Uh, so it's in our roadmap, but we're not there yet. Uh, the B2B business cycle, I think, again, has been, uh, it was very slow during the pandemic. We've been largely uh, dependent on our network and the financial inclusion and financial sectors across the continent and not able to meet institutions in person and get handshakes done across the table uh, is, is a real barrier for getting business done on the continent. Um, so we have been fortunate in that we've reached a tipping point um, earlier this year where uh, almost all the interest in our platform is inbound. And that's coming from some of the eminence and publication of thought leadership and research that we've been doing, uh, some successes that we've had and visibility and certainly something like Women's World Banking and the opportunity to continue working with the network um, will we'll, we'll serve that well as, as well. So that's, that's really helping reduce our customer acquisition costs, um, but they were long cycles and they were expensive previously. We're finding more efficiencies and that's what's really driving our, our model uh, showing profitability next year. So I hope I answered both those questions and if there are others, feel free to reach out. 
Hi, this, this is a great presentation and uh, very relevant for a lot of our markets. Uh, question from me is, as you expand to additional markets, what does it entail to go into one more country? I'm guessing you've got to localize and do a number of operational activities. What's that effort for expanding into additional markets? Yeah, I can definitely start on that from the content perspective. Um, so Chris, if you go back to one of our slides just with our images, so we've actually streamlined our production process to be able to localize very quickly. And this is from creating, you know, set scenes that we can just plug in place in different animations depending on the storytelling. But we've also created characters that are a little bit more ethnically ambiguous to allow this to localize very quickly from context to context. So it's really just a more fancy version of stick figures, if you will. So stick figures, you can't really tell what race or ethnicity they are. But then depending on the partnership and the context that we're trying to engage in, we'll also do minor, minor little tweaks to the animation to let it feel more relevant to our users. And we've also um, created a process where it's very easy for us to tap into local talents for translations, for voiceovers. So we actually have um, all of our content in over 10 to 12 different languages, from Tree to Spanish, French, Swahili, and we this is part of our process that we've made so that we can scale to multiple different countries very quickly. Great. So we have time for one more question for the Mosabi team. If uh, any of our judges have a last burning question for the team, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, maybe I have one question. Uh, I'll just jump in. Uh, so. When it comes to the uh, the customer base or they, or people who are most engaged with the platform, uh, can you tell me a bit more about like who they are? What sort of customer segment is it? Is it mostly youth, or is it uh, um, surprising a different uh, customer base? Can you tell me a bit more? Yeah. So just from you know a general overview, eighty percent of our customers are youth, and we define that as users who are thirty five years and younger. Um, and also 60% of our customers are also women. So we're really trying to tap into this informal sector where it's mostly African or emerging market entrepreneurs who haven't had access to formal education or also capital, um, capital opportunities. Chris, I don't know if you wanna add on a little bit more to that to flush that picture out. But per perhaps just as a follow-up to that question so I can learn a little bit more. So I know you guys are spread across a number of different countries. Do you see uh, a fair bit of overlap of customer base across these diff different B2B partners? Or are they all different siloed pools of customers that you're engaging with, depending on your business relationship? I, I'll take that one, Kay. I think it's, it's definitely the latter there, Dave. Um, just because by and large, uh, in our first few years here, the majority of our users have been onboarded through our partners, right? Um, so, for instance, when we work with um, uh, a, a whole host of different village savings groups in our home market of Sierra Leone, these are all very rural sort of off-grid savings groups. And by way of the facilitating partners that we work with, which are World Vision, Care, CAFED, Port Aid, um, they're, they're almost all women in those groups, right? Now, um, we're not, we're, we're definitely, as Kay described in our presentation, we have a special focus on empowering women, but as we launch in other countries, we may not have that specific partnership dimension that's, that's uh, so overwhelmingly targeted on women. Uh, we're, we're launching next month in, in, or later this month in Rwanda, Francis and I will be there and uh, working with a partner that, that uh, you know, is, is targeting broadly across the base of the pyramid. So we're going to be serving those safe types of users. So is there overlap? Yes. Uh, but the, the dimensions and different lenses by which our partners approach their markets and target their products, um, it definitely plays a big part um, in, in what kind of segments we're targeting as well. And, and to add one last thing that I think that's incumbent upon us then to make these really good decisions about who we partner with, you know, are we partnering with responsible, transparent providers that prioritize client protection or offering truly inclusive products? Um, you know, we've set ourselves at, uh, in, in the sector in, in task forces and among dialogue. Uh, where we really make sure we're, we're connecting with those types of providers uh, that place the clients first. 
Great. Thank you so much, Masabi team. Thank you very much. And thanks for all the questions from our judges. I'd now like to welcome our second finalist, Hive Online, represented by Sophie Blockstad, CEO and co-founder, and Matt Mims, COO and co-founder. Anna and Teresa are smallholder farmers in Mozambique who've joined a women's cooperative. They didn't have credit history, so they couldn't get credit for seeds and fertilizer to both grow better crops. Last year, only 0.6% of farmers in Mozambique got access to credit, and most of them were men. But we're all going to need farmers to grow more food in the future. And the land is there, but it's not being used because of inefficiencies and a lack of liquidity. Anna's cooperative needs liquidity, but they need access to markets as well. Last year, a pig at their crop forecast, so they couldn't pre-sell to buyers. So our holistic solution builds a bridge to the digital economy. Farming communities get market access through digital forecasting. Buyers, lenders and distributors get real-time data and digital vouchers, taking the cost and risk out of buying, lending and distribution. <clears throat> Not all of our customers have good connectivity, so it works partially offline and with very low data usage and doesn't need internet, but it's built on a robust blockchain fund manager so records are reliable and can't be overwritten, and it's building the foundation for the future distributed economy, so farming communities can be sustainable and financially independent. Like Anna, many women don't have access to phones, so we leverage social structures like savings groups and cooperatives to make sure nobody's left behind. Every member gets an identity, a wallet, and a digital history without needing a phone, using a minimum of one device per group. So Anna can get the input she needs to grow better crops and afford to send her girls to school. Group operations and transactions are transparent, reducing corruption and increasing confidence, which keeps more money in the communities. More NGOs are recognising the need for sustainable digital solutions to help the communities that they support, and they're sponsoring our rollouts and integrations. They train cooperative managers and savings group leaders to swap their old paper records for the app so farmers like Anna don't have to change the way they report um, forecasts or saving groups to get the benefit of digitization. And while we're mostly replacing paper, of course, there are competitors in the market. We can undercut the cost of telco mobile money and we go way beyond the offerings of traditional savings group software. And in fact, we've been talking to DreamSave and to mobile money providers about potential integrations to help support their platforms. We're growing rapidly in three African markets and going into two more, reaching a total of more than 30% of Africa's smallholder farmers, or 70 million smallholders. And as those farmers get more efficient, then our market share can grow three times. I'm Sophie Blackstad, CEO of Hive Online. In my banking career, I worked in 60, more than 60 countries, many of them in Africa, and I saw firsthand how difficult it is for banks to work with African farmers. So I've brought together leading talent from Africa and Europe, along with world-class financial technology. We speak 13 languages and we're passionate about the countries we support. Matt and I have built core banking, payments and communication systems and businesses for nine international banks. And I'm a leading blockchain expert advising the UN and central banks. <clears throat> We've also won lots of prizes, including MIT Solve, giving us access to cash, market, uh, sorry, partnership opportunities, um, and great press coverage. MIT also gave us prizes for blockchain and innovation for women. Most of our revenue comes from partners keeping costs to farmers low. We're a for-profit and should be break even by the end of next year. And while most of our revenue, 1 million euros to date, has come from sponsored projects, as we expand, more will come from monetizable features from those partnerships. It's easy to deploy to new countries because it's very scalable. And we're partnering with household names like Save the Children and Mercy Corps to, to expand into new, new territories and reaching hundreds of thousands of farmers and families in these countries. We're also building out more monetizable features and extending our reach to customers across the value chain, expanding beyond our anchor communities. So we're raising a million euros to grow our sales and feature development teams, as well as increasing our, our reach into the lucrative mobile money 
market with with our with mobile money licensing in some of our key countries. We'd love to talk to interest I'm sorry to impact focused investors um, who who can help us through the growth period that we're going to be going through in the next few months. We hope that you'll join us and these women in building the sustainable digital agricultural economy for tomorrow. Thank you so much, Haim Online team. Uh, now open it up for Q and A. And Dave, if I can actually turn to you first, if you have any questions. Uh, hi everyone, thank you so much for the presentation. I'd love to learn a bit more about the blockchain element. Uh, it seems to like gloss over a little bit. So, as Sophie, as a blockchain expert, uh, I'm really looking to you for help here. So on one hand, you talk a little bit about uh, using blockchain for data transparency. So here I'd love to learn a little bit more about two things. Which blockchain are you guys using? And second, uh, are you using a blockchain for anything more than just data transparency? So we're using the blockchain at the moment mostly for data transparency. Um, we're on the Stellar blockchain, um, but we've built a three token structure, which is a fund manager, which is based around a stable coin. Um, we have two, uh, two extra assets. Um, one is which we use for vouchers. So to answer your question, we're using it for vouchers as well. Um, and the other is a debt token. Um, and we can use these three assets in multiple combinations to move different types of value around. Um, we need licensing to switch on the stable coin as a value transfer, but we can peg it to any currency. Um, so to your answer, not just open transparency, um, we're going beyond that as well. Sure, and just as a follow-up to that, uh, so I see that you're, you're using the group structure to really engage with, uh, with end users. How have you found the whole digital confidence piece there? Are they, do they know they're interacting with uh, the Stellar blockchain or is it more in the background? Can you tell me a bit more about that? Um, I mean, to be honest, they're not interested in blockchain any more than the, you would be interested in your bank's Oracle command line programming interface that it probably still has. Um, so we don't expose the, the use of blockchain to our customers. Um, we obviously tell them we're doing it, but it's not relevant to them. In terms of the, the groups, um, we, we work with the authority figures who tend to be the more literate and the more finance, and more digitally literate. Um, however, we do come across customers who've never worked with technology before. Um, and some people, especially older women, do struggle to adopt mobile technology. Um, but it's usually the mobile technology that's the barrier rather than the app. Um, it follows the processes that savings groups and cooperatives already do on paper. So it's quite easy for them to adopt in that sense. Thanks, Sophie. Sarah, so yep. you've come off mute. Yeah, please just, jump in. I was just going to ask around um, uh, the sort of the, the, the financial plan path to profitability. I think you mentioned, Sophie, um, that a, a, a good amount of the the funding or the sort of the, the revenue so far has come through sponsorships. Um, what is the what's the plan to monetize fully and and the path to to commercialization? Okay, so we have several assets that, or rather several services that are monetizable, um, starting with vouchers then lending um, and eventually um, transactions as well. Um, we also plan to sell data, um, which is very valuable to governments, NGOs and, and large corporations. Um, but vouchers and lending are the first two monetizable elements because we don't need a license to run those. Um, and there we're charging a 2% fee to the lender. Um, as well as um, we've got a, structure, a, a pricing structure for vouchers and we can undercut the cost of traditional voucher distribution from the NGO sector and they currently spend $38 billion on voucher distribution every year annually so there's a huge market to address there. Um, so in short, first of all we're going to be starting by, by effectively monetizing the aid business but then moving on to more um, up the value chain, more data plays with global buyers as well. So it looks like you're relying pretty heavily on the the group model, savings groups and, and lendings groups. Was that at all affected um, during COVID when uh, social distance has been so important and we've seen a lot of groups not be able to continue in, in this environment? Has that affected your, your model or your, um, your rollout plans? Um, absolutely, of course it has. Um, you know, at first there was a, a much more focus on health, absolutely rightly. Um, but we saw an acceleration in adoption because we can help groups to run um, separately um, because of the, the fact that it's a, it's a digital platform so they can work in small groups. 
Um, so what we saw was groups meeting in smaller numbers. In fact, that's still happening in Zambia um, and maybe running a meeting over the course of several days. Um, so it actually enables social distancing as well. Sure. So what, what's the biggest challenge that you're facing today? Um, so the biggest challenge that we've had recently is connectivity in our Matt about that. I think that was coming to me. Um, connectivity is, is one of our biggest challenges um, because obviously we're working in remote regions um, and rural rural areas with a lot of these groups. Um, we've done a lot of work to, to make sure that we're using low data. Um, we only require one group, um, uh, one device in every group, but it's still something that we're consistently working with around how do we um, how do we support the, the majority of the people who, well, as many people as possible within those communities. So we're always going through a process of trying to make more and more functionality available offline, but also enabling them to be connected as best they can be to the, the overall um, ecosystem as they, as they do that. Um, we're trying to, to, to work at a sort of a larger level with some governments and, and, um, and other bodies that are trying to sp support rural uh, internet connectivity as well. Um, and partnering with, with some organisations, but this isn't a solution that one organisation can solve on its own, um, even though we're very aware of, of the, the challenges. Nithya, I had a, I had a quick question. I, in, in that, that um, set of um, challenges, I didn't hear anything about regulation, and I, I, I had expected that. Are you, are you encountering encountering even, you know, just confusion from regulators about stablecoin, blockchain, um, you know, how, how, are, how is the receptivity on the regulatory front? Yes, so we are approaching that stepwise. Um, we have engagement with a partner who is working with the Mozambique government um, with a fintech sandbox, um, and we're choosing our countries very carefully as well. I mean, obviously, Nigeria does have significant regulatory barriers to using digital assets. Um, we actually think that after the election, um, there's, well, we think there's going to be a change. And we also think that now that they've announced they're announcing that they're um, releasing their own CBDC, um, that there will be an opening up of interoperability to, to Naira denominated stable coins, which ours are, because that will promote the Naira as a currency of choice. Um, and not the US dollar, which is the thing they see as the big threat at the moment. Um, so we take it on a country by country basis. Um, I also do advisory work supporting central bankers um, to help them understand um, what these digital assets are and what the potential implications are from an economic perspective. Um, so we've sort of got a dub double, double approach on that. Great. So question from Otto Williams. Um, how are you protecting consumer data and privacy? All right, I think Matt can take that one. Yeah. So, so, so firstly, data privacy is one of the most important pieces about what we do. Um, and so, so firstly, obviously, people are concerned when we say we're using blockchain, etc. Um, are we storing even any personal information on the blockchain? No, we don't. So we, we store um, the wallets and we store keys to those to identifiers to those wallets, but we don't store public uh, private information um, on those um, on those individuals on the on the blockchain. Um, we also take an approach generally that this isn't our data. This is the end user's data, um, and actually in our data um, monetization design, uh, we see um, we're looking at ways we can do revenue sharing in order to support um, the the management of the the data by the end users and the monetization um, as well. Um, it is a, it's, it's, it is always that double edged sword of, you know, data users need to be able to share their data in order to get value. But obviously, sharing it with the wrong parties is is obviously um, dangerous as well. That's also why we require um, opt in and um, um, to even share data with um, the NGOs that they're working with, whether that right now, obviously, some of our programs that's being done on paper based on signing um, approvals and, and data sharing, but actually we've built it into the app as well on our, on our co-op product so that um, 
groups can affiliate with different organizations and share data like that. So there's always more that we can be doing, but we are very mindful of that and, and building that is part of the way we build so that we're, we're mindful of, of the, the value and the importance of, of personal data in that. I was just going to say I would add to that. Yeah, I would add to that that um, as well as protecting our customers' data from institutions that um, they that they don't want to see that data, um, we also encourage multiple institutions to to provide products to the customers so that they have a choice. Um, because what we don't want to end up with is is a monopolistic relationship where a single financial institution has the um, you know the monopoly on on lending and therefore there is a risk of, of price manipulation. Thank you so much, Hive Online team. Please join me now in welcoming our third finalist, Boost Capital, represented by Lucinda Revel, co-founder and co-CEO. Uh, so hi, I'm Lucinda. I'm the co-founder of Boost Capital. We've created the technology to offer microfinance loans through smartphone. We're making microfinance services cheaper and easier for people to access, rolling out in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's especially convenient for women who might have family responsibilities. Just uh, last week, I had to take my three small kids to the bank to arrange for financing a car purchase, and it was not fun for any of us. So I wish I could have conducted it all from my phone after the kids were asleep. Uh, we're all familiar with the problem. Microfinance is still mostly delivered through in-person interactions at the bank branch, which poses particular, particular challenges during a pandemic. Uh, the financing gap for female entrepreneurs is especially daunting. Uh, digital solutions are very sorely needed, and Southeast Asia's high digital penetration rates mean that it, there is high scalability. At Boost, uh, we're empowering customers by being more accessible and more affordable. So uh, we're also very intentional in our credit underwriting to encourage uh, income generating loan usages. And we've tailored our loans to the needs of MSMEs, over 60% of which have been used to support, over 60% of our loans have been used to support small businesses. We also quite fundamentally believe in the positive impact of financial education for our customers and for our company. So our solution is an end-to-end -end digital financing experience. In the phone on the left of the screen, you'll see highlights of our user experience. We start with a chatbot credit application uh, uh, in which uh, even informal entrepreneurs can build a PL in a way that's intuitive to them. Within 10 minutes, they have a dynamic loan offer based on their profile. We do tech-enabled KYC, and the result is a validated low-risk loan. The process uh, is built to be high inclusion. It works with messaging apps that more than three-fourths of our launch market already use. So there's no additional tech barrier to entry and the applications are 24-7. The process is convenient and of clients uh, surveyed 100% say their next loan will be digital. Uh, we've tailored the experience to female entrepreneurs to process um, uh, in terms of our process and also in terms of our loan product. So our loans go up to $10,000 in Cambodia, which is quite calibrated to the local market demand for business building capital. And then the digital process also allows us to build a huge data pool to constantly improve our offering and our underwriting. Since our founding, uh, we've also offered free, accessible, engaging financial literacy with real-time feedback via chat and live learning sessions, all in local language. It's good for our customers and it's good for Boost. So 20% of our current customers come through our financial literacy channels and we're building a data pool to enable a virtuous cycle where active learners access advantageous financial services. The opportunity for quick deployment, for rapid learning and for iteration is immense because the courses are digital. Boost is innovative and unique because we're scalable and low cost with great customer experience. Uh, we service a customer five to seven days faster and save them 20% compared with a traditional MFI loan. Uh, that's the kind of advantages that can help female entrepreneurs really grow their businesses. Uh, but we don't sacrifice the best of traditional MFI lending like many other tech disruptors have. 
We can process both collateralized and uncollateralized loans, which lets us lend larger sums for productive usages rather than focusing on consumer and payday lending. Um, our thorough application process results in NPLs under 2%, which means we can sustainably offer below market rates while other disruptors lend at up to 300% APR. Our tech has enabled 175,000 clients to interact digitally with MFIs with over 1.6 million in loans dispersed so far. Uh, it's a sticky product with 40% of customers repeating. 60% of our clients are women and crucially we're in line with the risk profile of traditional MFIs. Um, we're growing rapidly through our own B2C loan book because, um, which we use as an incubator for new tech. And then we're also partnering with MFIs to onboard customers for them digitally. Uh, this B2C, B2C channel gives us additional revenue streams, and we expect to reach 50 million customer inquiries and 500 million in loans enabled by our tech by 2025. Our team is 50% women, meeting one of our key KPIs of gender balance. We've raised 1.75 million in funding from venture invest investors who are aligned with us as a female-founded company. Time. There was so much more to go through, but hopefully I get to it in the Q&As. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Lucinda and uh, Boost Capital team. I'll now open the floor for, for Q&A. So, Lucinda, I, I'm, I'm, thank you very much for the, for the presentation and for underscoring your women clients and your outreach to women. Could you just say a little bit more about what, when you say tailored to women's needs, what, what does that mean? What did you change? What did you do differently to meet women's needs? Yeah, I'd say really the last year has been really one in which we've tried to focus on the female entrepreneur. Um, when we first started Boost, we very quickly proved out our hypothesis that there was a great product market fit for digital loans, especially when traditional MFIs have been moving away from smaller loans because of their higher operating costs. They're not economical. Um, but we also found that about a third of our applicants were entrepreneurs who didn't qualify for loans because they didn't have um, collateral and the banks wouldn't lend to them without a salary slip to prove their income. Um, so we saw this big opportunity, especially when it comes to um, female run businesses to support productive loans for entrepreneurs. Um, and so we approached um, PACT, uh, which is supported by USAID to create a partnership with them where we could develop a technology to service loans to those female entrepreneurs where um, they would guarantee, the PACT would guarantee the loans. So the full risk didn't fall on our balance sheet while we were in the pilot period. And, and we've been developing the tech so we've been offering uncollateralized loans um, between $300 and $5,000 to women entrepreneurs under that partnership. Um, and then we've also been working with UNCDF to create financial education targeting female entrepreneurs, particularly in the FMCG space. And that's really allowed us to expand our educational offerings and also to build out the integration between financial education consumption and expanding access to financial services. I'll jump in with a question, Lucinda, um, the, 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 the issue of microfinance and microcredit is, is long been known, um, uh, the, the access to, to credit and capital in Southeast Asia, long been known, particularly for women. Um, what are you doing differently? Uh, what are you doing? What are you doing different than sort of the, your predecessors before you? What are you doing that, that's, that's different to help solve the problem? Yeah, I think that because we're digital, one of the big differences is the data pool that we've been building. So that data pool really allows us to um, shape and iterate so many things. Like it allows us to work on the customer experience um, to know uh, how to, we can implement tests at all times to say, if we implement this change, how does it affect our customer? How does it affect our funnel to make data-driven decisions on the customer experience? Um, it affects our credit underwriting. So we can take what has been working for MFIs for years, which is understanding the uh, ability to repay, like income, expenses, can they afford the loan? But we can supplement that with tons of markers about probability to repay, um, about their credit awareness, about their interaction with financial education, um, about how they've actually gone through the loan process, how quickly they took it on, um, 
all these additional data markers that we can add in. Um, it also allows us to inform our financial product development with data. So that's actually the, the fact that we saw the opportunity of customers that we had to be uh, turning away is what led us to create the new product for female entrepreneurs. Um, and then it also helps us with marketing um, on both a macro and a micro level. We can do um, micro retargeting based on our data pool. And I think those are all big advantages that allow us to access a wider uh, pool of people to be more inclusive, more impactful, um, but also lower cost and to pass those savings on to our customers. So a big difference between us and other lenders is we're 20 percent under the market rate. Lucinda, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, actually, pretty innovative. Are you, do you have your own app for the chatbot experience or are you using sort of like, you know, the WhatsApp chat platform? And how are you collecting or gathering the data that you're using for underwriting? Great question. Uh, so we chose not to build an app. And the reason is because it's a big barrier to entry. Uh, we found that a lot of customers don't actually have the ability to install apps on their phone. They don't have email addresses. It doesn't let them into the Google Play Store. They can't control what's on their phone. Um, whereas if we work within the chat um, programs that are already on their phone, it's much easier. They don't have to install an app and commit to something before they can find out if they're even qualified for a loan. So we work within the chat programs. Uh, however, we, however, we built a couple of tools that sit within those programs to help us um, deal with some of the shortcomings of those messenger programs. So for instance, if you try to share an image over Facebook Messenger, it downsamples the image. So it's not usable at the end. Um, so we built an image uploader so people can take pictures of their ID, their salary slips, their um, business, uh, their, their books, their, um, their invoices, and they can share those to us without uh, down sampling the image. So we've created a couple of different um, tech tools to sort of supplement the existing program, but it never asks the customer to leave the, the chat experience. So it's much easier for them. And it's also quite secure. We've made sure that the back end makes it so that there's no chance of um, losing data or sharing data. Thank you. Uh, Pat, I'll quickly turn to you if you have any questions. Yeah, you mentioned um, tech enable KYC. Can you share more about that? What, what does that mean? Sure. So we do uh, video calls with all our clients. At different, actually, we do multiple calls at different points in the process because we found, one, it's great for KYC, and two, it's great for customer experience. They do like to be able to have a chance to talk to a human being. It's like the blending of tech and touch. Um, we do try and be efficient with that time. Uh, because we don't want to uh, drive up our operating expenses, but we do like to give customers a chance to, to ask and answer questions. Um, we do also, um, we've built in the tech that sits within the chat experience so that customers will scan their um, loan, or their uh, national ID, consent to having their credit check with a, uh, an e-signature um, with their finger. Um, and so that allows us to check their credit history with their consent. Um, and then we also do for collateralized loans, we can record uh, meetings with uh, in Cambodia in the context, um, all collateralized loans have to be witnessed by a government official. Um, and so we found ways that we can actually record those interactions and save them for later um, so that we can make sure that also like the collateral interaction is quite secure in terms of KYC. Mary Ellen, let me come to you. I think you had another question. I, I did. I didn't even entirely understand that about the government official needing to be present, but that, that wasn't my question. Um, could you say a little bit about where you're getting your financing from? Because that seems to be such an, and not necessarily the equity so much as, as your ongoing um, debt financing. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. There was actually a slide on that that I didn't have time to get to. Five minutes is hard to, to pack it in. Um, so in terms of equity, um, we've raised $1.75 million so far from venture investors. Um, and then we'll be going into Series A in 2022 um, with the hopes to raise another $3 million. Um, from the debt point of view, we've taken on um, wholesale loans from a few different parties. Um, uh, Singapore-based lenders. Um, we're just lining up another one that is based out of Europe. Um, so some 
uh, smaller scale wholesale um, lenders who are interested in lending to this space and I think are especially interested in the fact that now we have a tranche of our loan book that is actually guaranteed um, for those female entrepreneur loans. Um, it really de-risks it. So we find that um, being able to have an we're presenting a portfolio that has a really good NPL rate, like we're below 2%. Um, and then we're trying to de-risk some of our um, pilot projects that are we think are high impact, but also we wanna make sure we're not taking on too much risk. Um, it, I think it gives us a pretty good lending profile, I'm sorry, borrowing profile. And so we've been able to um, borrow, I think about a, th a third of our loan book at this point. And, and just a quick follow on, like how how are you learning from the experience of those guarantees? You're not always going to have the guarantees. What, what are you building into your process into your system to learn from that, you know, that experience of having the guarantee? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think what's we're doing with the guarantee is we're taking on just an, a little bit more risk than we would normally, but we we bear a portion of the. Um, expense for defaults. And we actually advocated for that approach when it came to building the partnership. We said, we want to take 10% of the risk um, because it makes our interests with the guarantor uh, aligned. Like we don't wanna have this be risk-free for us. We wanna be making the right choices in a sustainable way. Like we wanna be making the choices um, now with maybe just a little bit more uh, leeway, but the same choices that we're gonna be making going forward. Um, and under the partnership, actually we, we're, we're working with a tech that we've already been, uh, we've had in use for two years and we were expanding it to smaller loans. So it's sort of like a, 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 a little bit of an access to a risk of a new pool, but not too much. Um, that tech, by the way, I didn't get a chance to go into in detail, but it, we think it's really interesting. It's basically to uh, assess um, the profitability of uh, small businesses through chat. So the same way that normally a person would come in and have a conversation with a credit officer at an MFI to describe their business, we do that all through a chat interaction. Um, and then we've built in a bunch of sanity checkers within the chat to say, based on our data pool, um, with this kind of business, we might expect this information. You're giving us something different. Do you want to recheck that information? It's all iterative and it takes about 20 minutes. Great. So I think we have time for maybe one more question um, before we move on to our, our last candidate. So uh, any any last questions? Sarah, I think you came off mute. Yeah, maybe it's just you mentioned the loss rates um, of about two percent. Just ha remind me, how long have you been operating, and what's the period over which you've been you've been looking at that? Our first loan went out at the beginning of two thousand and nineteen. And then Pat, I think you wanted to jump in as well with, with a question. Did I see you come off me? Yeah. Yes, you did. Um, uh, yeah, just a quick question around uh, customer acquisition costs. Um, what, what, what percentage is that ultimately? Yeah, I think our um, CAC we're working on, on lowering it is currently about $20. Um, and we're working on um, reducing it actually a lot through our financial education channels, but because that's a great opportunity for organic marketing. Um, and so it's coming down steadily. Um, our LTV is, I think, about 310. Uh, so it's a pretty good ratio. Thank you so much, Lucinda and the Boost Capital team. Um, we'll now ask you to exit and we'll have our, our next presenter come in. Yeah, I just wanted to say a quick thanks to Women's World Banking for including us in the network over the last year. I think it's been really great in keeping us like focused on the importance of making sure that women and their financial inclusion have been peeking into every corner of our company and our mission and our practice. So thanks so much. Thank you for saying that. That's what it's all about. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much, Boost Capital team. I'd now like to welcome our fourth and final finalist, People's Pension Trust, represented by Saqib Nazir, CEO. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, it is a great honor for us to be at this stage of this challenge. Our solution is a private pension for informal workers. Uh, as you may know, 90% of the workforce in emerging markets is informal, farmers, traders, domestic workers, and micro, small, medium enterprise operators. Ghana has 
13 million of such informal workers. Africa has an estimated 400 million, and globally, across the world, there are over a billion informal workers. Uh, the sad reality is that the majority of these informal workers will end up in old age poverty, and the even sadder reality is that women make up a large percentage of these informal workers. People's Pension, licensed in Ghana by the National Pension Regulatory Authority, has stepped in to help solve this crisis by providing pensions and other financial services to these unbanked and underserved populations in order to reduce old age poverty, but also to help them build a better life for themselves for today and for tomorrow when they do retire. It is my pleasure to present our solution, which allows anyone to create a pension account with us and then save any amount, no matter how small, at any time of their convenience. All of this is done in a few steps on any mobile phone, smart or not. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Jacina showed here is a 45-year-old trader, one of the many women who operate at Makola Market, uh, one of West Africa's busiest markets. Uh, like many other women, Justina's retirement plan was to depend on her children, but she is now signed up onto people's pension, and despite the daily struggle to make ends meet, she has been putting aside the local equivalent of $4 every week into her pension account. While this may be a small amount for you and for me, it will give her enough of a fund at retirement to allow her to take care of herself into her old age. This gives her some independence and some dignity. Justina has in the past taken advantage of the withdrawal option to cash out some money in order to invest in her trading and is also grateful to have the inbuilt life insurance cover. We are now looking at uh, incorporating income insurance and even health insurance on the request of some of our organized groups. Regular messages keep her updated on the status of her account and we have built in some financial literacy, health, well-being and business skills into these messages which we hope will allow her to improve her life and her livelihood even today. Uh, next slide, please. There are many other members like Justina who are able to register, contribute, and withdraw through the use of any mobile phone and mobile money. The mobile apps, which work on all kinds of phone, bring, out a certain, bring about a certain convenience and independence, as well as transparency of every transaction and the interest gained so far on the funds invested. Justina has recently switched from cash payments to automatic deductions on mobile money, which she says has just made it so easy to contribute to her pension. As we don't want to leave anyone behind, our agents also use their apps to record and receive cash from members who do not have mobile phones or mobile money. We send out SMS receipts for every transaction, and we are now piloting voice receipts for those who are illiterate. COVID has further amplified the need to move from high-touch to digital for all our members. Uh, next slide, please. Our current membership today, as of September 2021, is at 52,000 members, and 40% of these are active, meaning they contribute regularly. And out of those active members, 60% are women. The average contribution we receive is around $3, and the most popular saving frequency is on a weekly basis. Uh, our current AUM, that is the Assets Under Management, is around $1.5 million, and our revenue, as regulated by law, is at 1.33% of the assets that we hold under management, giving us a revenue so far in 2021 of $20,000. We are now looking at exponential growth by leveraging technology and partnerships to grow. We expect to grow to 1 million customers in Ghana over the next four years, and we also expect that our average contribution will grow to a larger amount as we reach out to all segments and breaking even in 2025 with a revenue of around half a million dollars. Leveraging the existing customer base as well as the trust and reputation of our various partners, we are now poised to grow fast. We already have a partnership with Vodafone and with Etel Tigo, and two weeks ago we launched our partnership with Ecobank, a Pan-African bank in over 30 countries, to roll out pensions across the informal sector. We have many such partnerships in the pipeline, which will take us into Nigeria, Kenya, and Benin, where we are conducting regulatory and business reviews. We expect to serve millions of informal sectors across the world, not only through partnerships and mobile money, but also by referral program and incentive programs, utilizing behavioral science, human-centered design, data analytics, and eventually down the line, artificial intelligence and blockchain, keeping in mind the issues around data privacy. Pensions are especially important for women who often earn less, yet live longer, and often take time out at childbirth and have to look after dependents. Our data so far shows that women save more consistently and in smaller amounts. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for that presentation from the People's Pension Trust team. I'll now open the floor for Q&A. Sakib, uh, very impressive solution, and I think it solves a real uh, pain point and need out there. Tell us a little bit about your team. Uh, you know, how did you come together to uh, form this, and who makes up the team? Oh, sure, thank you. So we're a team of about 30 people, and this is not including our full-time agents uh, um, who operate in the market. Uh, the team is led by myself. Uh, I have a background in technology and uh, digital payments. Uh, my chief operating officer, Kofi, has um, uh, 20 years experience in, in the informal pension space, having set up the government's informal pension fund about 15 years ago, which was later closed down. Uh, um, uh, our CFO is very active in the space. And then Ya, our communications manager, uh, has also been uh, involved in um, um, reaching out to informal segments. Uh, we're also, uh, one of our directors um, is from DRK Foundation, which is one of our shareholders and our investors. Um, our team is made up of um, people in operations. Uh, we have a small um, uh, call center. Uh, we've also recently hired two ladies to help us in um, data analytics and data science. Uh, and, and we're looking to grow the team as we grow. We, we also have uh, five branches across Ghana uh, led by business development managers. So it's quite a strong, robust, and mature team coming together to, to help solve this problem. Sarah, I'll turn to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sakib. Um, great, great presentation. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the member growth, how you'll drive that member growth and maybe bring in, um, you mentioned agents, how they play into that. Sure. So, I mean, traditionally we, we've um, had agents on the ground recruiting members directly collecting cash, uh, but of course that is expensive and not very efficient. So over the last two years, we've really uh, pivoted hard on technology. Uh, leveraging mobile money and mobile phones in order to bring about efficiency and scale. And then I also spoke about partnerships. Uh, one big issue in financial services is, of course, trust. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of money to build trust. And so by leveraging the, the customer base and the trust of our, our partners, which included Vodafone, Airtel Tigo, and I, I spoke about EcoBank, and we have a few such pipelines and uh, uh, partnerships in the pipeline, we're really looking now to grow fast. Um, we will also be using, I mean, we could only hire about 20 or 30 agents, uh, but now our partnership brings us, uh, in the end, it will bring us tens of thousands of, of agents across the country. Uh, in Ghana today, there are 200,000 mobile money agents who are active in, in helping customers cash in and cash out of mobile money, and we, we aim to use uh, a majority of those also to become our customers, uh, our agents. Um, and this is very much in line with sharing agents uh, uh, to help those who are uh, not so tech savvy to sign up and to become their relationship managers. Um, but for us also, direct growth through our apps, through our USSD, and then I spoke about referral programs and incentive programs. We think that will now take us um, into the realm of exponential growth on, on customers and also on engaging them to be consistent in saving with us. Great. Pat, I'll turn to you for any questions. Sure. Yeah, great, great presentation and really refreshing to hear as well. Um, Pat, how do you compare against your competitors from a financial standpoint, but also the approach that you're using in terms of your model? Thank you. You know, so far there are about 30 licensed pension companies in Ghana. We are one of those. But um, what we find uh, is that um, no one is really interested in the informal sector because a lot of hard work. It is hard work. It's not easy uh, reaching out uh, to collect small amounts of money uh, from many people. You know, it's just so much easier to focus on the formal sector. But we have made it our mission to focus on the informal sector. Uh, so that's one approach. Secondly, technology is a huge, you know, the technology to manage informal pensions is very different from the technology to manage informal pensions. Informal pensions, there's no really no choice. 
uh, the company automatically deducts your pension from your salary and pays it to a formal pension fund manager. But we have to engage with our clients to keep them engaged, and it's very exciting. And using data analytics, uh, like I said, incentive programs, marketing, it gives us a lot of room for engagement and learning. So yes, to be honest, we are more a bank, actually, than, than a pension fund sometimes, because we also do allow withdrawals, so customers can withdraw money. They are limited to withdrawing, by law, 50% at most, uh, but only six months after having started contributing with us. So it's actually quite exciting. I, I look at myself sometimes more as a neobank, right, than a pension fund. Yes, the, the exciting thing is that this is long-term customer acquisition. And it's also long-term, so it gives us a certain comfort that we are, you know, we're not having to fight for this quarter's returns and this quarter's revenue. We know that our business model is long-term, so it gives us certain comfort in engaging with our customers for the long-term. And that's also nice and rewarding uh, by also partnering with insurance companies, we've layered on life insurance, we're now looking at health insurance, we're looking at income insurance, and then additional value-added services. I, I think we are becoming a trusted partner ourselves for, for our customers, and that's very uh, reassuring and comforting for us. Cool. And how does the regulator see that as a, a potential neobank? Well, we're fully compliant with the pensions law. You know, we're doing exactly what the pensions law allows us to do, uh, nothing more, right? But just by bringing in technology, right, it has really, I think it's a game changer uh, to allow customers to uh, sign up for recurring payments, to be able to top up at any point instantly, uh, to be able to demand a request for a withdrawal and have it within a couple of minutes, right, to see their balances grow, I mean, those are exactly what the pension laws allow us to do. Um, I think in the past, I don't know if we are the first to do it, but I haven't seen anyone put in the same amount of uh, technology and uh, customer behavior, putting you know, the customer in the center of the application. Um, of course, I'm biased towards my own uh, company and my own application, but I feel, at least in, in the experience that I've had, uh, not many people have gone to that length and I think uh, treating the company also as a fintech company uh, brings about a different dimension for scale. Uh, it's just not possible to do this in the old fashioned traditional way. So we couldn't have done this five years ago or 10 years ago without the prevalence of mobile phones and without the prevalence of mobile money. It would just have been too expensive. Thank you. I could ask more questions, but I don't think I'll be allowed. <laughs> we, we can talk one on one. <laughs> Call me anytime. Any other questions from, from our panel, Otto? Any any questions from, from your end? I think Mary Ellen has a question. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Can I, I ask a question? So, Sakib, so, so um, how much leeway do you have in the investment of those assets under management? Is, is it entirely regulated, your portfolio, by the, the regulator? Or, or, you know, since you are these are such precious sums that you're, you're managing. How, how much leeway do you have in their investment? Yes, not much. Um, so it's highly regulated and we actually never touch the money. The money goes straight from the customer to our uh, custodian bank, which is Standard Chartered Bank. And from then on is swept into the fund manager, which is an investment bank. The investment bank is also regulated by the pension authority and by the Security and Exchange Commission but we make the decisions together, right? So they advise us, and if there are any options, they give us the options, right? And we tell them which option we would prefer. But really, you know, because as you said, these are precious funds, uh, there's a low risk, you know, mandate around them. You wouldn't want a situation. Of course, look, it's invested, so it can go up and down. Today, we're seeing actually amazing returns. We're seeing almost 19.5% returns in Ghana but that's because in Ghana, the government is borrowing heavily, treasury bill rates are high, you know, and also inflation is a bit, little bit high at 10%. So the one thing that does keep me up at night is, is I do worry about the kind of return we'll be able to give our customers in 20 years time when they're returning. That's not in my hands. It's dependent on so many factors in the market, but we're doing our best, you know, and, and so it's highly regulated and, um, you know, it gives everyone comfort. If we should go kaput for any reason, you know, we share data regularly with the, with the pension authority, and so they should be able to refund all the customers the money or 
or move over the funds to another pension company. You know, so we, um, it does give us all comfort that we are all operating in, under the right guidelines with a lot of scrutiny, I must say, which is also comforting for us. I'm happy to, to be very transparent. Um, if I could just do a quick follow on Nithya. I mean, I, I love that you're addressing this problem. This is such an issue for women everywhere in the world. So th this, is, this is really getting right to the heart of, of women's safety net. But I, I wonder, you know, you, your little case study was a 45-year-old woman. If, if she only starts saving with you at age 45, you know, how much of a pension are you going to really be able to apply, uh, provide her? Don't you really need to be going for much, much younger people? And, and if the answer to that is yes, you know, how, how are you pitching to 20-year-olds? So, yes, it's true. We're targeting everybody. Right? We have people who are 60 who have signed up recently. Right? It's very interesting to see the hunger in the market for this product. Once again, I'm biased, so forgive me you know, for that bias. But, but really, yes, yeah, so we're targeting everybody. Everyone is excited with the convenience, with the flexibility. You know, everyone sees their future ahead right? and sees that at some point they will retire and sees at some point they will need some cash. So we are, now that our tech is ready, now that we have partnerships, Different partners will bring us a different customer base. Um, so, for example, we are also running a hackathon, right, next week to, to reach out over social media, right? We're, we're partnering with universities, right, to sign up students, right? Even if it's tiny amounts because it's more the experience and, and to get them, even as students, and students are relatively rich in our part of the world, right? How many people can really afford to go to university? So if students can start saving up, so by the time they're employed, they will already be in the habit, and we're already educating them around uh, uh, savings, financial literacy, you know, planning for retirement. So yes, you're completely right. I mean, I, we have requests from people who say, can I start saving for my daughter who is 15, right? So we've created, we're looking at creating products. We've created another product called iCare, which allows you to sign up someone you love or you care for. Uh, it could be your domestic worker, it could be your mother, it could be your sister, it could be your daughter, right? It could be anybody, the taxi driver. And so we are hoping that those kind of programs, and that's why I'm also excited about actually the, uh, uh, the scale and also the liquidity that we will bring, or the liquidity that we'll be able to access. Because I think, you know, having started out from the bottom of the pyramid at market women, uh, it does skew us in a certain way. They are very vulnerable. But I feel that as we reach out with technology into apps, social media, uh, online advertising, and partnerships, we'll have access to a much broader market and a much broader segment of all ages, all kinds. And this is where, to be honest, we can't do it ourselves, right? There's no way we can reach out to everyone, and partnerships are very important for us. Every partner brings a specific customer segment, you know, and, and, and we're eager to see how that segment behaves. And, and work with them to, to build then specific products for that segment. What a thrilling and inspiring pitch session. Thank you to all of our finalists for their time and efforts and their work to really drive and progress women's financial inclusion. And thank you to our esteemed judging panel today for their rich questions and putting our finalists in the hot seat. With that, I'd like to welcome uh, Mary Ellen Iskandarian to share a few remarks to close out this portion of today's programming. Mary Ellen. Thank you, Nithya. And thank you to all of the finalists of this year's FinTech Innovation Challenge. Each presentation was extremely impressive and really reflects your distinct and creative approach to leveraging technology in order to bring financial services to the women that need them most. Recent estimates indicate that COVID-19 has pushed 47 million more women and girls into extreme poverty. And that increases the total number of people living in poverty to 435 million, with no sign of reverting to pre-pandemic levels for at least another decade. I trust that your vision and dedication will undoubtedly continue to make a difference at a critical time for women whose resilience literally depends on secure, affordable access to financial services in order to emerge from the COVID-19 crisis. Each of your solutions offers much needed support for unbanked and underserved women across the world, whether that means allowing women-owned MSMEs to get greater access to credit, 
to help close that $1.7 trillion financing gap or building alternative credit histories and facilitating market access for women farmers who would otherwise be really constrained due to a lack of education, technology, and property rights. Or empowering female grassroots entrepreneurs and MSMEs with the, with the help of digital learning. Or enabling women workers to save for their retirement as COVID-19 impacts pension systems around the world. It's also important to remember that the FinTech Innovation Challenge is not just a one and done event. Rather, it represents really just a beginning, one in which we welcome three of this year's finalists, Hive Online, Mosabi, and People's Pension Trust, as the newest members of Women's World Banking's network. And we look forward to continuing to work with and growing our engagement with Boost Capital, an already established Women's World Banking network member. We recognize that great things lie ahead for each of these companies and the unique value proposition they offer. I'd also like to thank my fellow judges, including Catherine Budd, Sarah Ellenson, Dave Kim, Pat Patel, and Otto Williams. Thank you for your careful and thoughtful questions and your input into this process. So please stay tuned to the end of today's event to find out who will be selected winner from our four tremendous finalists. And thank you again to all the finalists, judges, sponsors, and all of you for participating in the Women's World Banking FinTech Innovation Challenge. Welcome back. We are nearing the exciting end of the FinTech Innovation Challenge event. I want to personally thank Ariana Wunder for helping me prepare for today. Um, it's the third year that uh, we have this challenge. It's a, such a valuable initiative of which Women's World Banking is very proud. And we look forward to fostering even closer ties with each of the year's finalists, prize recipients, and future applicants. On behalf of the NYU School of Professional Studies, I'd like to add that it has been a true pleasure collaborating on the FinTech Innovation Challenge, and we look forward to further synergy. The NYU School of Professional Studies is committed to empowering individuals through diverse and inclusive learning opportunities. And we hope that by providing this year's recipients with continuing education courses and certificates, we equip them with the necessary skills and insights to grow their ventures. At this time, I'd like to present Mary Ellen Iskandarian, our wonderful president and CEO of Women's World Banking. Mary Ellen is a passionate advocate for the role of FinTech's play in financial inclusion, and she will have the pleasure of sharing the prize recipients of our FinTech Innovation Challenge, after which she will offer a few closing remarks. Mary Ellen, the stage is yours. Martin, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. A CEO always likes to hear those kinds of words from her, her board members, but uh, thanks so much to you and to all of you uh, joining us virtually in the audience for this exciting moment, this big reveal. Um, each year, the FinTech Innovation Challenge Women's World Banking sets out to discover emerging fintechs that are leveraging technological innovation to better serve unbanked and underserved women worldwide. When we first launched the competition in 2019, we wanted to see just how bold fintechs as so-called industry disruptors could be in designing more financially inclusive solutions. Because for us at Women's World Banking, True disruption really isn't about stealing revenue from legacy financial service providers by serving their already well-heeled customers. Real disruption is about filling the void that those legacy providers have left and addressing the needs of the nearly 1 billion women who are excluded from the financial sector. I think Isabel said it really well in the fireside chat this morning. It, it's not about fighting over those same five to 6 million borrowers that the banks are already serving, but then leaving two thirds of the market unserved. It's really about addressing a much more inclusive sense of the financial sector. So as Martin said, we're in our third year with the FinTech Innovation Challenge, and I think we've established a bit of a global reputation amongst equity-minded innovators who are seeking to advance women's financial inclusion. We have been blown away by the response to and the enthusiasm for the competition. 
you've probably heard these statistics already, but I think they bear repeating. This year we had 80 applicants from 34 countries. And as, the, uh, as Joanne mentioned on the last panel, the dearth of female founders was not in our applicant pool. 75% of our applicants came from female founded companies. We are equally amazed by the time and effort that our judges and our advisory committee members made to the challenge. And it's you who really made this a success. Together, they've given us over 160 hours deliberating on the finalist pitches and providing mentorship to the finalists. As many of the panelists have said today, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has inflicted significant economic and financial damage on the global community, with low-income women in emerging markets bearing the brunt. Fintechs, though, can play a critical role in driving greater access to financial services for women, and our finalists will undoubtedly be part of this effort to help build resilience, and economic prosperity for low-income women in a post-COVID world. So I'd like to take a special moment to thank our four incredible finalists, Hive Online, Boost Capital, Mosabi, and People's Pension Trust. I wanna thank them for their forward-looking achievements in the FinTech industry. And I wanna commend all of our challenge entrants for their commitment to making finance more inclusive. Women's World Banking is delighted to welcome our four finalists as the newest members of our global network, which is on track to reach a whopping 100 million women clients by the end of this year. Joining 57 existing network financial service providers in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, the Middle East and North Africa, and Europe, our finalists will champion women's financial inclusion, and gender diversity, and, their share, and they will share their knowledge and learning with their peers. As network members, they will also benefit from Women's World Banking's unique solutions, services, and global connections. As they work to make financial services accessible to women, we look forward to providing them with continued support and guidance. And lastly, before we reveal our grand prize recipients, I would like to recognize my fellow judges. Catherine Budd, Sarah Ellenson, Dave Kim, Pat Patel, and Otto Williams. Thank you for your careful deliberations and input in this process and for frankly making it a lot of fun. Special thanks as well to our advisory committee of Sriram Jagannathan, Karen Miller, Ade Ashe, CJ Yuhas, and Nithya Sharma for kicking off this process and helping evaluate applications and selecting our finalists. And now it is my sincere pleasure to officially reveal the grand prize recipients of the 2021 Making Finance Work for Women FinTech Innovation Challenge. These two FinTechs will receive extensive support from Visa Inc., the NYU School of Professional Studies, and Women's World Banking to grow their companies and take their solutions to the next level. All of us believe profoundly that both of these companies have the possibility to bring about transformative change in the lives of even more unbanked and underserved women. This year's grand prize recipients are People's Pension Trust, represented today by Saqib Nazir, the CEO, and Boost Capital, represented here by Lucinda Ravel, the co-founder and co-CEO. <laughs> I, for one, cannot wait to be able to do that in person again, but um, I, we, we have it virtually for you. Congratulations to you both. Uh, Sakib, people's pension trust by making retirement savings simple and affordable, you are addressing one of the most critical problems faced by literally every country in the world. And you've recognized <laughs> they're still going. And you've recognized that women face a triple threat to their long-term resilience. They tend to live longer than men. They tend to have less consistent, sustained earnings since they often come in and out of the workforce. And they earn less money than men over their lives. Thank you for, <laughs> Thank you for tackling this vitally important issue 
And we look forward to supporting your journey and your continued growth in Ghana and beyond. With that, Saqib, I'd love to give you the floor first if you'd like to say a few words. Uh, thank you so much, Mary Ellen. It, it's a real honor uh, to be selected as a winner of this FinTech Innovation Challenge from among this incredibly talented group of finalists. I'm sure you had a tough time in selecting the winner. Uh, we truly appreciate this chance to share our mission and vision for People's Pension and to benefit from your incredible mentorship and guidance. Uh, having this recognition and access to your network and resources truly means so much to us. And we look forward to growing people's pensions and reaching many more women across the world. Thank you so much for this incredible opportunity. Thank you and congratulations. Lucinda, this year's judges were so impressed with Boost Capital Solutions and with your perseverance. As our audience may remember, Boost was a finalist in last year's FinTech Challenge. Since then, the company has made important adaptations to its product that are critical to serving the women's market. The judges were particularly impressed with the introduction of a non-collateralized loan product, since lack of collateral is the single biggest barrier to access to capital faced by women-owned companies. We look forward to working with you to help accelerate your scale and impact. Lucinda, I'd love to turn the floor over to you to say a few words. Thank you so much. Uh, we're honored the judges have recognized Boost's achievements in empower empowering women through access to fair, fair financial services. We're so grateful to those who have invested in us, partnered with us, and advised us. And with your continued support, we will reach more and more women with our digital services and financial education. Thanks so much to Women's World Banking for including us in your fascinating network and for really trumpeting the importance of keeping financial inclusion for women at the core of our company mission. If you're interested in learning more about Boost Capital, ping us on LinkedIn or email, and we'll include you on our updates about our progress, especially as we grow into our next fundraise in 2022. Thanks so much. And again, congratulations and thanks to you both.